What's up, YouTube? It's Corey McKinnon here, real estate investor for close to two decades, over 150 doors, and several multi-million dollar businesses. Today, we're gonna to be talking to you about the top five things that you wanna keep in mind when buying property for income purposes in 2022. You're gonna to wanna to check this out. All right, before we get started, everybody, there's a little bit of a, an elephant in the room here. I know there's a lot of you that have been watching the videos because we've got thousands and thousands of views, but not as many people smashing the like button and destroying, yes, absolutely destroying the subscribe button. So please do us a favor. It really helps us grow the channel. It shows other people what's relevant out there. So please hit the like button, destroy the subscribe button, and drop some comments because we always read them all and reply to every single one, all right? So let's get into it. Again, the top five things that you wanna keep in mind when buying income property in 2022. Now again, I don't have a crystal ball. I guess I do have one. <laughs> um, but you know, this is only as good as I bought it for at Walmart <laughs> a few weeks ago. So I'm gonna give you my top five criteria that I look for when buying all income properties. But you know, we're under a lot more pressure these days to find good properties. So I wanna give you the best that you should be considering anytime you buy a property. So the first point here is that you wanna make sure that you get equity on the buy. Yes, you need to buy things on sale. Now you might not always be able to get something on sale when you're buying something as large as a property, but if you look hard enough and you turn over enough rocks, you will find things that are gonna be on sale. And it's either because of some motivation on the seller side, or it could be because the person who's selling it, who, who owns it, they just don't know the fullest and highest best use of it, and there's some something that needs to be unlocked. So let's talk about these two points here. Now, if there is motivation from the seller, I usually say it's the seven Ds of motivation. It could be disease, and if that's not taken care of, that could lead to death, unfortunately. Uh, divorce also leads to motivated sellers. You could have a disgruntled landlord. I've bought properties that way before. Um, landlords are just tired and fed up. They've had their last straw. Uh, could be someone that's displaced, right? They're living out of town and they're just too far detached from the property. It's a problem or they don't really know the market and how well it's maybe doing. It could also be too much deferred maintenance on the property, which is huge, and then too much debt. If somebody has too much debt, they're gonna need to sell off that asset at some point. Okay, so that's a motivated seller. A motivated seller is typically a little bit more willing to negotiate with you because there is things there that need to be overcome. There's lots of headwinds there. Now, on the other side, if the seller, maybe they know the potential of the property, but they aren't willing to do the work, put in the time, effort, energy, or money to unlock the full potential. For example, I've got a 10 acre lot of land and they knew it could be turned into a subdivision, but they just weren't willing to put in the time and work over a period of many years to clean up the land and to bring in the utilities and to wait for the sewer capacity and all those things to come online. So I know once we do that project, it will yield some great dividends there. So that would be getting equity on the buy. The next point would be being very aware of the city that you're investing in. Not every city is created equal, so you wanna make sure that you have some criteria to think of and keep in mind when you're buying around the world. So for me, I mean, it's numbers based. If we're buying something to make income, you gotta be worried about the numbers. And the things that I look for when it comes to the numbers are, number one, uh, what is the population doing in that city? Is it growing? I like to see over 3% population growth in a city. That definitely shows me that, let's say 400,000 population, you know, there's gonna be 12 to 15,000 people, new people coming in every single year. Like that's thousands and thousands of people. That's gonna impact the housing demand in that city. The other point when it comes to the city that you're investing in is that you wanna make sure that the jobs are strong and that there's diversification in the job. Okay, you want to make sure that there's not just one or two or three main employers in that city You want to see fairly diversified and with these kinds of times that we've been facing right now these COVID times I like tech you know, technology is important. Is there technology jobs in the city? And I also like consumables. Are there things in the city that are manufacturing or building things that people consume and use on a regular basis? Or is it a hub where people can go buy these things? Super, super important, all right? The next thing is going to be kind of the, the side effect of both of those points there, but how strong are the rents? And how strong were the rents years ago? Okay, so if the rents are strong because you have the population going up and you have jobs coming into the town, it typically takes care of the vacancy rate and the unemployment rate. I mean, you typically don't have a, a city where the population is increasing dramatically and you have a lot of jobs as well as the average wage of the job is important too. If you have those two things, typically it takes care of the vacancy rate. Vacancy rate would be pretty low and the unemployment rates would be pretty low too. 
which leads to strong rents, okay? Because people are gonna be competing for those apartments and they'll be very eager to sign leases quickly. You know, we put an ad on the internet and people just like, man, I always tell my, my assistant, okay, once, once you post that ad, just remember your inbox is gonna blow up and your phone's gonna be blowing up. You need to stay on top of those leads. Now, the last point when it comes to the city that a lot of people don't think about, but we do need to be mindful of the situation that we're in and what we're gonna be facing in the future is what features and attractions does that city already have that are already built that don't have to be rebuilt, that people can enjoy, all right? Because to me, with the cost of building, that is something that you should be aware of. And if these things are already done and already built, like the mayor of that city is not talking about like, okay, in three years, we're gonna be pro proposing this, or in five years, this, or the long-term plan is this. You know, are there, is there waterfront? Have they already updated their highway systems? You know, is there like state parks, provincial parks, or national parks close to where you are, like a short drive away? that people can really enjoy going in different directions to do different things if they're staycationing more these days, right? So very important to think about all those points when considering the city that you're buying in. So the next point here is gonna be how much work is there to do on the property? Now there's a big difference between cosmetic renovations, which is like you know paint, flooring, fixtures, um, maybe cabinets and things of that nature, doors, windows, things that are easy to pull out and put back in, versus like full gut job, like heavy intensive structural work and fixing major problems, foundation problems, redoing roof lines, building additions, all those sort, sorts of things. So right now I'd recommend that you focus mainly on cosmetic renovations. And even then there's gonna be like different levels of cosmetic renovations. Your easiest would just be going in and cleaning and painting, maybe swapping up fixtures. Next would be like flooring and cabinets. So make sure that whatever renovation you're doing here in 2022, it makes sense for you to do because there's a lot of uncertainty with trades, getting materials delivered, um, even just windows. Like right now at the time of filming this video, it's like five to six months just to get windows because they're being shorted on the raw material to make the vinyl and to do the glass and everything else. So it's not like there's not people out there to install them, but you're being shorted by the raw materials. So make sure you're questioning, does it make sense? You know, lots of times people, it's an ego thing. I just want to go take on this product, you know, it's such a big project. It'd be so great. This could really put me on the map. Well, it could also like finish financially drain your bank account too. So you gotta weigh those two things. And right now, at least for me, I'm passing on a lot of big gut job type properties. I don't mind old, I don't mind tired, I don't mind a little bit dirty because those things can all be overcome with cosmetic renovations. All right, next point here is going to be, do you have multiple strategies for this property once you close on it? And I'll give you a great example here. About three years ago, I bought a fourplex and I was originally gonna go fix it up and treat it like a flip and just do like a really fast burr, I guess, and then unload it for a sale. So really it was gonna be a fourplex flip. But as we were working on these units over the course of a year, cause we had to have tenants move on and, and renovate the units and things were going a little bit slow. There was some problems, some major foundational structural issues we had to fix on that house. You know, the neighborhood really started to gentrify. Maybe we started a little bit of a, a trend in the neighborhood. Jobs were booming, population was booming in one of the cities that I invest in, which was Southern Ontario. And you know what? At the end of the day, we're like, well, we're actually gonna pivot this to now to just holding it. So instead of, you know, I, I paid off the money lenders on that one, we put a regular conventional mortgage on it and it was going so well that I said, okay, we're gonna long-term rent it. And then I changed that from long-term rent to short-term rentals, actually medium-term rentals, because we're renting there for like one month or more. And it's been a fantastic property. So always make sure that you have more than one thing that you can do that with that property, especially if you're a flipper or a wholesaler. You know, as a wholesaler, are you willing to actually close on that property yourself? Or if you're a flipper, are you willing to hold it? Could you actually rent it? Could it be a, could it be a seasonal rental? Could it be a regular rental? Could it be a rent to own? You, know, you just need to make sure that there's multiple strategies once you close on the property in case things do change. Things can always be getting better or things could also get worse as we've seen here over the past couple of years. All right, now my last point here, but before I get into the last point, I really wanna make sure if you guys haven't liked or subscribed to this video, please, please do so. All right, so the last point, how easy would this property be to sell if you had to sell it quickly, all right? So does that property have some features and some zoning that are highly desirable to the next person? You know, I was watching a video recently, uh, Grant Cardone bought a property on a beach. It was actually Tommy Hilfinger's former residence. And it had this beach house down by the beach that was grandfathered in. They won't allow anybody else to do something like that again. But you know, if you have some of these things that are baked into the deal when you buy it, there should be some extra juice in the deal, you know, some extra potential for you. Maybe it's a maybe it's a, a lot you could sever. It's a really deep lot that you could do um, like a coach house in the back at some point, right? So just make sure that it checks some extra boxes when you buy. Um, now don't don't get analysis paralysis and don't just wait on the sidelines, not buying just because things are a little bit challenging these days. I highly recommend, you know, follow what other people are doing, uh, get yourself a mentor, get yourself a coach, 
um, invest in yourself, get some learning and get some training, but don't stand on the sidelines here in 2022. So those are my points there, everybody. Make sure that you're getting equity on the buy, make sure you're aware of all the strong key points in the city that you're getting. Um, be aware of how much and how intensive and how difficult those renovations are gonna be to do. Is there more than one strategy you can implement once you buy the property? And then how easy it would be if you had to go sell that property. So those are my tips for you for buying property in 2022. We'll see you on the next video, everybody.